Hi friends, welcome. We are continuing today with program number 27. In the uh, section one of Dinah, so it's volume one, section one, and we have reached part six in this video commentary. Today is the 14th of August 2021 and uh, I want to uh, <clears throat> say in terms of the little segue I like to include that um, DK has given us contact, impersonality and love. These three, he says, uh, constitute the individual objectives which I set before each and all of you. The individual objectives. Now, he's going to go on and give us the group objectives. Okay. The group requirements which must be met and preserved by the group as a group are as follows. And you see, may I say, we've moved up to perhaps the true objectives of these groups uh, concerning not specifically the individual, but uh, the quality of the group. So, the very, um, the very first one is group integrity. And uh, let's see how many we have. Group integrity, we're going to have fusion. which he says, you know, is not the same as identification, then we're going to have understanding. Well, understanding uh, is given um, some quite good definitions at the very beginning of the book, Glamour, A World Problem. So now let's look at what are these group requirements for the group as a group. Group integrity. This, he says, grows out of right integration and refers to the delicate balance which must be preserved among the members of the group. May I say this word delicate is important. There's nothing heavy handed or involving forcing when we consider what group integrity may be. Um, you know, the integration uh, formulas may come in play here and they precede, don't they, the fusion formulas. DK goes on to say, this is of such a nature that there emerges eventually a group steadiness and a group freedom from oscillation which will permit of uninterrupted group work and interplay. It will come, uh, he says, if each of the group members will simply mind his own business and permit his group brothers to mind theirs. 
uh, may I say it's uh, interesting how it comes down to such a almost platitudinous requirement. Keep your mind on your own business and off the business of others, the way they may conduct their understanding of the uh, roof requirements. DK goes on, it will come if you keep your personality affairs, your private concerns and troubles out of the group life. Well, uh, may I say that um, suggests forget the good self and the bad self and let only Christ be seen and heard, which is like let only the plan um, be seen and heard. Uh, going on with DK, it will come if you refrain from discussion of each other and of each other's affairs and attitudes. Yeah. Well, DK speaks from experience here. And uh, he knows that so many tendencies uh, prevent or work against the group integrity. So whatever will promote right integration will promote the necessary delicate balance between the members of the group, which will, of course, promote the group integrity, meaning it's a well integrated group and not just integrated within itself, but integrated in relation to the group soul. Now, He's really telling us, isn't he, to stay out of each other's business and says, this is, he says, of supreme importance at this stage of group work. It will mean if you can achieve success in this, that you will be able to keep your minds clear of all lesser things, which concern the personality life. And this means that your minds will be free, therefore, for group work. Well, let me say there are so many preoccupations uh, which are very secondary and which lead us off the track. DK can look into the heart soul of each group member and see to what extent that group member is fostering the group integrity the group togetherness, the group um, interaction and the way the different aspects of the group life fit together and fit together with the soul and also with the master. So don't we find that some tremendously practical yet simple suggestions are being offered here? And um, 
he's just trying to make the group fit to work as a group so that, as he says, a group steadiness and a group freedom from oscillation, may I add, you know, that's the approach and retraction, approach and retraction, the light burns brighter, the light becomes dimmer. That is so frequently the case. So freedom from oscillation results, and he says, which will permit of uninterrupted group work and interplay. And then this uh, long list of how the group integrity will arrive. We mind our own business, meaning we take care of our own approach and let others do the same. We keep our personality affairs and troubles out of the group life. We don't discuss each other, certainly not in any negative or critical or divisive sense. So we don't discuss each other and each other's affairs and attitudes. That means, doesn't it, that we have a certain trust in each other. And all this um, of supreme importance, he tells us. And then our minds will not be captured by non-essentials, and they will be free. Our minds will be free for the uh, for the group work. So, okay, group integrity is one of the requirements. Now, remember that in Esoteric Psychology, Volume 2, there are the integration formulas, which uh, <clears throat> I think we can link with group integrity and the fusion formulas. Fewer in number, but applying uh, largely to the first three rays and then uh, the rays of attribute share in some of the uh, fusion formulas applied to the uh, first three rays. Let's say uh, that for ray four, uh, ice, not, uh, okay, uh, what's it called? Um, isolated unity and, uh, yeah, inclusive reason, or even presented attributes, as the ray four can switch to either ray two or three, and ray five will switch to ray one primarily, and will therefore attune with isolated unity and ray six again, either a transference to either ray um, two or three, so therefore um, inclusive reason or presented attributes would apply. But I think in these particular cases, the, the six and the four pretty well go uh, into uh, 
I'm always <laughs> kind of pausing there. Inclusive reason. Um, you kind of wonder why Ray 5 doesn't go to Ray 3, but under certain circumstances, I, I think it does. And Ray 7 will go to Ray 1 and use the isolated unity formula, but Ray 5 is uh, very adept uh, at uh, presenting attributes as Ray 3 would do. So let's say that under special <clears throat> dispensation, Ray 7 may switch to the presented attributes of Ray 3 uh, in terms of these advanced meditation formulas, but normally into the isolated unity of Ray 1. Uh, sometimes DK talks about isolated unity as if it is kind of a poor choice of words for something he's trying to convey, but I think it conveys enough about how the one is always seen in the midst of the many. So then, yeah, from integration, we move on to the fusion, which I've just covered in, in a slight sense, fusion as a group requirement. By this, I mean the ability of the group to work as a unit um, with a great uh, sense of togetherness. Uh, there is a merging of the group parts, not just a coordination of the group parts as we might find with group integrity, not just coordination, but a merging of the parts. And DK says to us, this is dependent upon the achievement of right individual attitudes and, when working, the attainment of the capacity to lose sight of everything except the work to be done. Now, that's uh, kind of a, a golden phrase. The capacity to lose sight of everything except the work to be done, and a deeply sensed love of your brothers. Well, let's pause there to achieve this fusion, to achieve this fusion we must learn to ignore many secondary factors. I guess as we are approaching some kind of soul residence where our consciousness is really held within the soul, that is generally true. The non-essential is lost sight of and the work to be done stands out in bold relief and then something may be difficult to achieve if we are of the critical turn of mind and believe that our method is the best and maybe only method and should be followed by everybody. Well, if we believe those fallacies, 
than that deeply sensed love of our brothers will not emerge. So just pause for a second, a couple, I mean, a little while, and think about your group or groups and whether there's, there is this deeply sensed love of our of our brothers and sisters of course but as you know because humanity is a masculine kingdom um, DK tends to address everyone as a dear brother well at least um, at the in its present in Incarnation, humanity is expressing masculinity. So we see the work. Forget yourself. Concentrate upon the plan. The work needs you. So, in that order, we've had um, group integrity, which is really uh, a function of group integration, and we've had the succeeding stage. We find it succeeding, uh, following that is, in Esoteric Psychology Volume 2, the stage of fusion. And then the stage of understanding is a group requirement. I use the word, he says, in reference to your comprehension of the work to be undertaken. I do not use the word in reference to your attitude to yourself or to your group brothers. Well, that's, that's an important uh, distinction, really, isn't it? Going on with DK, he says, it means that each group works wisely and understandingly at its own appointed task, knowing that it contributes to a whole which exists in the mind of a master or the master and basically uh, when you look at those groups the 10 c groups each one has its own appointed task even though let's say dk didn't get to the point where he was able to organize all of them with the war intervening, very serious war that could have set humanity back to the very beginning, if not for the intervention of the Lords of Liberation. So I'll repeat what uh, he says about understanding because it's perfectly natural to think he means understanding each other and understanding uh, our group brothers, uh, or rather oneself and our group brothers. So he says, I use this word in reference to your comprehension of the work to be 
undertaken. Now, we can pause for a moment and ask, in a, in a group in which I, meaning you, <laughs> are working, um, do you understand, do you comprehend, really, the work that is being undertaken? Well, let me say, we have to know what we're doing in the context in which we are doing it. If I'm working with the group of psychologists, uh, I am not working in the same way as with the group, the uh, economic group of financiers, let us say. So there's a certain kind of... Um, ring pass not, which is drawn around the group um, to make sure that it sticks to its own business, <laughs> with, to which it lends its mind. So I'm going to uh, do a little bit here which helps us um, point out the three requirements that are analogous to the three requirements of the individual. But maybe, if anything, these are more important because they are <clears throat> group requirements. I think you can see, can't you, that um, the word understanding can be used meaningfully in a number of ways. And I think you understand, <laughs> and by, I'm using it in yet a different way, that fusion follows integration. And in the esoteric psychology book, it does. Somewhere maybe in the middle 300s, he gives the integration formulas. And then later, in the 80s and 90s of esoteric psychology too, he gives the fewer uh, fusion formulas, which are themes for advanced meditation. Okay, so, integrity, fusion, and understanding, says the Tibetan. This is the order of the work, and the sequence of development so that's important to know what we do first and what are the consequences of, let's say, doing that work correctly. Uh, DK goes on and says, all groups working in the outer world in relation to the ashrams of the master, 
Let us note that he didn't say uh, in the ashrams of the master, but in relation to, because um, many of these groups are quite peripheral to the ashram. They are related, but they are not yet uh, in incorporated, which means to be taken into the body of the ashram. So repeating there what he says, all groups working in the outer world in relation to the ashrams of the masters will follow certain initial and final stages in their work. And these will be uniform for all the groups. And I'm noting that probably he's speaking very much of his own groups, but uh, that does not necessarily disclude groups that may be sponsored in a somewhat similar way by other masters. So there will uh, follow, he says, certain initial and final stages, um, and these will be uniform for all the groups, no matter what their specific and individual group work may be. Thus, he goes on, there will be brought about an intergroup relation and a consequent strengthening of the individual groups. So let's get that into a notable condition. There are similarities, there are differences, but the similarities are sufficient to um, bring about a successful intergroup relation. And uh, as he says, a consequent strengthening of the individual groups uh, within his own 10 groups, either formulated or intended to be formulated, there can be a mutual uh, strengthening when there is right uh, intergroup relation. And we can probably find the ways in which that strengthening does occur. Um, now he goes on to say, the third stage of the work to be done will be special and particular, differing for each group and to be followed by the group with meticulous care. Meticulous care. I think DK, may I say, likes that word meticulous. And um, it applies, as we know, to the meticulous entirety associated with one of the aspects of the second ray. So there is, may I say, special and particular group work and a meticulous way to follow what is required of each group. He goes on to say, I would ask all the various groups which may be working under my direction to attend to their own <clears throat> individual group business and not to speculate 
as to the nature of the work being done in the other groups. Well, may I say we do have our limitations. And simply being uh, human beings in process of uh, esoteric education, we're in no position, really, since we can hardly handle our own business, group business, to start, you know, handling or commenting upon or advising about the group business of another group. It would be a waste of time. So there's going to be a general strengthening from group to group, and then there will be specialized work, and that specialized work will be laid out by the master and is to be followed with meticulous care. The thing about Master D.K., really, he says, read more carefully what I have written. And so many of us may just uh, gloss over and say, oh yeah, I've, I've read the section one of uh, Discipleship in the New Age. Oh yeah, I read it. But looking at the detail, oh, under the ray of detailed unity, looking at the detail that is included in the group instructions, one sees that one must be very careful indeed. Not necessarily even that we have all the ways we must proceed, but we certainly have enough ways which require um, a deep esoteric attentiveness. So, this is DK talking about the third stage of the work to be done. And I guess it is related to understanding, really understanding the task. Right now, I work a lot in the field of esoteric education. What is the task? Of course, that fourth C group has connections with some other ones of the C groups, whether yet organized or not. I guess it has to be realized that the founding members of the organized C groups have definitely passed on. All those early disciples have passed on. The inner integrity exists, but the outer form will have to be attended to once again. And I say to myself, well, I'm trying to uh, present a way that people can think with care about Master DK's words and some of the implications and connections which are not given uh, in the immediate section of text that we may be handling in the hope that the light will flash forth. 
Now, is that enough to um, cooperate um, meaningfully and helpfully in the field of esoteric education? Of course, the educators also are handling much younger people. Uh, and uh, they're working in the general field of how the masses of people are educated. And I don't find myself to be, at this time, involved in that. But still, I would say, the educational work, utilizing the head, the ajna and throat centers and the building of the Antikarana is very much the method which I find advisable to use at this time. And maybe each of you will find one of the organized C groups through group four and partially entering group five to be your focus. Now, your focus may really be one of the others as well, but DK had to cut that organization into a group of nine, had to cut it short, because much more important things about the survival of humanity as a whole were in the air and had to be dealt with. First things first, right? Now, DK goes on and tells us something about uh, the uh, stages to be followed. This looks partially meditative. Stage one, he says, alignment, soul contact, spiritual poise, and uh, he says poise is the steady holding of the achieved soul contact. That poise, I think, uh, shows up in one of the later um, laws of healing. Let's say it's one thing to achieve a fleeting soul contact is better than nothing, but to hold it steadily. This is already another step. And of course, we note that it is spiritual poise. Now, what would it feel like, we might ask ourselves, to sustain and steadily hold initial soul contact. So that's stage one, and he breaks it down a little bit, point A. Then the conscious relinquishing of personality reactions. And may I say this may mean a kind of withdrawal of the soul in incarnation from 
identification with or involvement with the personality and its customary reactions. One is very much the observer, but not so much the participator in those personality reactions. Next, point B comes the recognition of um, the fact of love as an expression of that soul contact. And expressed, he says, through the medium of the personality. So the personality reactions are not um, attended to. They sort of slip below the threshold of consciousness, but following the soul contact, a love seems to arise within the personality which takes the place of those uh, heretofore generated reactions. And finally then, the imaginative fusion. Note, imaginative fusion, because indeed we have to use our creative imagination. Finally, he says the imaginative fusion of the egoic and personality rays. And may I say it's usually the higher aspect of the personality ray, which is, which is uh, fused with the egoic ray. Now, we'll pause for a moment and try to consider the state of that desirable fusion as far as we are concerned. I am, um, if I may say, remembering a time in my life when I was very much on the fourth ray. And uh, artistic expression of some mu musical or theatrical kind was my dominating concern. But then there did come a time when some other energy appeared and began to overtake that fourth ray. And it was really the second ray of love wisdom, the ray of meticulous entirety, the ray of detailed unity, the ray of the divine pattern. And there was a struggle, of course, but ever since that time, um, that has been the dominating ray. So he's um, giving us stages to be followed, I think, as we uh, look at integrity, fusion, and understanding. So that's stage uh, one, and when we join, let us say, the arcane school or a similar esoteric school, well, one of our very first things is alignment and soul contact, one of our first endeavors and trying as much as possible to 
in a poised manner, hold that alignment. Now, when it comes to stage number two, let's see what he says. Um, the above is followed by group integration. So in, in a certain sense, it looks like the above applies to what the individual must do within himself before he is fit to participate in the group fusion um, process. We could wonder where integration has gone, but anyway, we our next uh, concern is fusion. So he says the above is followed by, well, okay, he, he puts them together by group integration and group fusion carried forward consciously. I guess that means that there's enough of similarity between integration and fusion that they can be considered two parts of an ongoing or continuous process. Now, how does it happen? A, he says, by bringing each group member into conscious rapport through naming and loving. Well, that, that must be then a very important aspect of bringing about integration and fusion at the beginning of group meditation. I think we, we have to note how important that could be, that it's not anything sentimental. Okay, the, you know, let's name who's here and love them. But it really um, contributes to group integration and group fusion. Then point B, he says, by seeing all the group members as a circle of living points of light, along with yourself in the circle, but not at the center of the circle. Because after all, let us say we are trying to decentralize our attitude and not to centralize it in uh, a personal sense. So we name love and imagine or see the circle of living points I'm thinking of uh, the illustrations by Francis Donald and how he oftentimes depicts the circle of even initiates in which we can participate and some greater figure is found at the center. Then point number three, C it is, point C, by imagining all these points of light as fusing and blending, making a radiant sun. So let us say we're into the fusion part more strongly than the integration part. And the fusion of the many points 
produces the solar likeness. So we have here fusing and blending and making a radiant sun, DK goes on saying, with rays of light going out towards the four corners of the earth. And do we see then how important are these um, imaginative processes? So basically, this is the stage we've just reviewed, the conscious carrying forward of group integration and group fusion. And then, well, DK says this is constituting the horizontal stage. Now, where there is a horizontal and it is mentioned, naturally, we're going to have a vertical coming up. And I wonder then if this next uh, process is the vertical. So then he says there follows next a careful consideration of group purpose and technique. And may I add, this is probably related to the stage of understanding in detail the group process. There follows next a careful consideration of group purpose and technique. This technique, he says, will be different for each group. Yes, simply that. By a dynamic, unremitting following of the particular indicated technique, will the results be achieved? So now it's just not just meticulous. It's dynamic and unremitting. Now, it is to be questioned how much um, has been given to us uh, concerning the details of the technique. But by a dynamic, unremitting following of the particular indicated technique will results be achieved. This technique must not be changed by anyone except myself. Well, DK is definitely uh, referring to the groups he has gathered around himself and not so much to the groups which other initiates or masters may have uh, gathered. But isn't it interesting, may I say, that he insists on exactitude there's always some helpful disciple coming along that says, wouldn't all this be better if in fact it was uh, changed in the following way? But that would defeat the purpose and would um, violate the unity of approach which he is trying to achieve. So we really need the results and we can get them in stage three. This technique must not be 
changed by anyone except myself. Now, looks like there's more here. Stages one and two should be rapidly effective and almost instantaneous in their results. After three months, careful work has been done. Careful work. He says, I request that you give careful, patient attention to them, to these stages and the techniques going on so that they develop eventually into stable habits and give you no trouble and further difficulty. The initial stages in this type of work are of paramount importance. Well, stage one, alignment, soul contact, spiritual poise. Poise is the steady holding of the achieved soul contact, and then stage two, the technique uh, of group integration and group fusion, and stage three, what is the group purpose and technique? So we have to understand that. And then group four, or stage four. Having finished the special group work under stage three, the members of the group will then endeavor to link up with the other groups uh, in the same manner in which they linked up with the members of their own group. So now this is being uh, extended, but the technique still has to be followed. So there has not been a, a stage four until this point in which we expand beyond the individual. So repeating what DK says, having finished the special group work under stage three, the members of the group will then endeavor to link up with the other groups. May I say this should not be too difficult if the creative imagination is used properly. So to link up with the other groups in the same manner in which they linked up with the members of their own group. Um, DK goes on. In this case, however, disciples will not concern themselves with the personnel of any of the groups, including their own, but only as a group link their group with the other groups. Now that's important, isn't it? From group to group without considering the personal factor, the personnel factor. Thus, 
he says, the illusion of the of separateness and the um, well, let's see here. Yeah, thus the concepts of illusion, or yeah, concepts of illusion and of separateness and the realization of fusion will assume correct proportion in your minds. So we are somehow blending here the uh, some of the individual work and some of the group work. Then comes another stage, does it? Well, at least it's probably on stage four. Next, he says, as a group, say the great invocation three times. Now, when this was written, that great invocation is going to be let the forces of light bring, yeah, illumination to mankind. Let the spirit of peace be spread abroad. Um, I'll get there. May men of goodwill everywhere meet in a spirit of cooperation. Let power attend the efforts of the great ones. Then, he says, we can understand this is a, a meditation form to be followed. That becomes clear now. Then sound the sacred word, the Om, three times. And point C, close with the prayer of the personality. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be always acceptable. Now that always um, is added in there. I've seen this mantra without the always, but let's go with what he says. And the meditation of my heart be always acceptable in thy sight, O soul, my Lord and my Redeemer. And the last part is sometimes different too. O Lord, my rock and my Redeemer is sometimes said. So we've been given now um, requirements for individual uh, effectiveness and for group effectiveness. The uh, individual effectiveness depends upon let's see here if I can reach that point. Maybe that's going to be a little more difficult than I thought. Hmm. Well, there it is. So the individual approach requires a facility of rapport. Um, it requires also impersonality. Yeah. And finally, it requires love. Okay, these are the three 
individual or a, let's say yeah personal individual requirements then dk goes on and tells us the group requirements uh, are group integrity fusion and understanding And then he begins to sort of mix them together as he gives us um, a kind of meditation, which involves, in a way, all of these six, but especially, uh, even though there is preparation on the individual side, we do end very much with the uh, group uh, requirements. So uh, stage one involves some personal work. Stage two, uh, a kind of integration and fusion considered as two aspects of one process. And stage three, um, to follow with understanding the group purpose and its particular technique. And then he gives some practical advice. Uh, work quickly through stages one and two, and um, then there is a stage four where the kind of alignments and interplay uh, extends from group to group without consideration of the personnel of the group. Either the group outreaching or the group to be reached. And then an ancient prayer. Well, the, the first of the great invocations and then the Om and then the prayer of the personality to the soul. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be always acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, well, I usually say that when I, I'm, I'm familiar with saying that uh, when I was a hired singer in the synagogue, O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer, but here from DK, O oh soul, my Lord and my Redeemer. Okay, friends, so we're on page uh, 63. And uh, we've finished, uh, well, finished. We've finished program 27. And we can put that in here, can we not? So here we are, and today being the 14th of August, um, and ending program 27, and going from page 60 to 63, we're getting there slowly but surely, and preparing for program 28, which will now begin with part 7, and uh, my guess is I can't really 
do more tonight on this, but it'll begin on page 63. Well, okay. And maybe this will be a little longer, I don't know, about 11 pages for part uh, four. Uh, so friends, uh, Tui and I and all the communications group of Biel and Joe and Michael and Mikhail uh, and the others who help us on a more occasional basis um, wish you lots of love and many blessings and um, a close study word for word of what DK has said and if it helps you then some of what I have um, spontaneously said may also be uh, considered. So program number 28 is coming up. And uh, all the very best deep studies, deepening meditation and effective service to you. And we'll see you before before long. Uh, I don't know if you'll get that far, but tomorrow uh, we have the uh, Assumption of Mary Day, uh, and Mary is more than the ideal disciple. She's also the symbol for the earth. Okay, we'll see you soon.